Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining our office hours on why Wisdom Tree believes the bio revolution could deliver strongly in 2024, where you will hear from Wisdom Tree's global head of research, Chris Gennady, and Jamie Metzl, founder and chair of One Shared World. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time uh, today with Irene, Jamie, and myself. I am a global head of uh, research here at Wisdom Tree. Um, you'll see the polling questions here. We'll we'll go through sort of the polling question and results uh, towards the end here. Um, but just to sort of set the stage, um, the reason that Jamie and I are together today, Jamie works with Wisdom Tree on a particular strategy. Uh, the ticker symbol for it would be WDNA. It's the Wisdom Tree Bio Revolution Fund. Um, we launched it at an auspicious uh, moment, you might say, uh, in 2021, and we all know what valuations of uh, riskier biotech companies were at that, or just riskier companies in general really were at that point. Um, but the, the reason that we wanted to do this webinar today is we believe there's some evidence that the tide is turning. And Jamie has been doing some work for uh, a pretty extended period now, uh, you know, connecting biotechnology and artificial intelligence. And if anyone's been following thematics in the last year, artificial intelligence was possibly one of the biggest topics we've seen in some time. But I, I wanted to first start off letting Jamie kind of take us through a bit of his background because he's done many things and then lead into the book that uh, is expected to release in June of this year. Great. So <clears throat> thanks, Chris. Thanks, Irene. Thanks to all of you for uh, for being here. Um, uh, so I've been working in at the intersection of AI genetics and, and biotech um, for a, a long time, and it hasn't always had the exact same names, uh, uh, but for at least 25 years, I've been thinking and writing and working in these uh, in these areas. Um, I was a member of the World Health Organization Expert Advisory Committee on Human Genome Editing. Chris mentioned my new book, which is called Super Convergence, and it's about uh, what the AI genetics and biotechnology revolutions mean for the future of healthcare, yeah, our economies, our societies, our personal lives, and, and, and many other things. That's coming out in June. My last book, Hacking Darwin, was a, a pretty big international bestseller on the future of human genetic engineering and the specific application of genetics and, and biotech to human health and human, um, and human reproduction. Uh, I'm on scientific advisory boards for a number of different companies, and I was thrilled uh, to partner with Wisdom Tree in the creation of our Wisdom Tree Biorevolution Exchange Traded Fund. Um, and uh, one thing that I'm more than confident of, I'm, I'm certain uh, that the intersection of AI genetics and biotechnology will be one of the most significant trends, not just in our in this year, uh, but in our lifetimes and in this era of human habitation on Earth. The two big stories of this era of humanity are human engineered intelligence and human re-engineered biology. So I'm, I'm certain of that story. It's going to translate into lots of things. Yes, it'll be really cool search functions like, um, uh, like uh, ChatGPT, um, but it'll also be through mundane things that you'll never see. When I lecture on uh, on this uh, these topics, as I do all, all of the time, it's like we're going to, when you when I say when I ask you all how did electricity influence your life today, it's just impossible to answer the question because our lives are almost entirely mediated by electricity. Yes, we. Without electricity, we couldn't be doing this video call. Most of us couldn't be living where we're living. We wouldn't wear the clothes uh, that we wear. Just really, it's hard to imagine much of anything that's not mediated through electricity, including camping in the woods, because the woods, the natural environment around us uh, has been transformed by uh, human electricity and industrialization and weapons and, and all, all of those other things. 
So AI, it's it's the same thing. It's not just about search. There is AI in everything. If you just have look at a, a fork a few years from now, there's going to be AI in that fork in how the metals were produced and processed uh, and how uh, in distribution and all of uh, in all of our networks. So that for me, that's a really important part of just my thinking and, and my work. And when um, Wisdom Tree uh, and I started to, to speak about the creation of this fund, um, my thesis then, as it is now, is this is a wave. This is a tidal wave transforming uh, humanity. And it's natural for us to think about it. in the early days of the internet, we thought, well, the internet is just about these few things. And it turned out the internet was about a lot of different things. And, and it's the same thing with this intersect with these intersecting AI genetics and biotechnology revolutions. Um, in the near term, it feels like, all right, maybe this is a story about healthcare uh, because we see lots of high profile stories talking about the application of genetics and, and biotechnology in healthcare. And I'll mention some of those in, uh, in just a moment. Um, but really the story is humans renegotiating our relationship with the living world. And certainly people get scared when they hear talk of things like genetically modified organisms. But when we take a step back, I think we realize, as I was mentioning before, uh, that we live in a world that has been created around us and our, and our technologies. All of the, almost all of the foods we eat um, uh, are genetically modified foods. All of the domesticated crops are, are, uh, are genetically modified. Uh, the environments around us are modified, not necessarily uh, genetically. Um, and so the question for humans isn't technology, yes or no. It's how best and most safely and responsibly to apply those those technologies. So, in the context of these intersecting AI genetics and, and biotechnology, um, what what I communicated in, in our early days of our of our collaboration um, is this is a story that's bigger than healthcare. It's about healthcare. It's about agriculture, plant agriculture, animal agriculture, uh, advanced materials, uh, energy, biofuels, uh, changing our models of how we uh, get the resources that we need uh, for our economies uh, from cutting them down and, uh, and digging them up to growing them. Data storage, uh, roughly every two years, we're creating more data than all of human history uh, up to that point. Um, and because none of us are, we're not collectively any smarter than our ancestors tens of thousands of years ago, the thing that we have is our cultural inheritance and our cultural inheritance is what lets us build on our starting point are the, the achievements of past generations. And so we're going to need to store the cultural history of, of humanity. And right now, we talk about the cloud as if it's some kind of abstract thing, but actually it's not floating in space. Uh, cloud computing is stored mostly on magnetic tapes uh, that last uh, about 30 to 50 years and need to be constantly copied. And that's a bigger and bigger job. Uh, but DNA can store uh, data for up to 5 million years under the right conditions. It's 100 times million, uh, 100 times million, 100 million times denser uh, than silicon. Nature has been solving lots of problems for almost 4 billion years. And now we're in a position of understanding that and then applying that, which is going to transform many different areas, uh, particularly uh, the ones that, that we're investing in. Um, and the ones that are that are identified in the, in the slide that's uh, that's on your screen. So just a, just a few kind of key examples and uh, and points. Maybe some of you were at the uh, J.P. Morgan uh, conference in San Francisco uh, that ended uh, that ended last week. Uh, after certainly there was a lot of excitement about biotechnology in uh, 2020 and the first half of 2021. And then with all of these things, whether it's AI or uh, biotechnology or the internet earlier, uh, there always is a hype cycle. And there always is, uh, people say in the beginning, this is the greatest thing ever. And then they bump into a wall and it goes down and think, oh, this wasn't real. Uh, but then it turns out when, for a lot of these revolutions, when we look over time, 
Uh, it was a continuous story, but with ups and downs. And so biotech starting in, um, in the second half of 2021 has had a real down, a, a very significant down. And, and uh, I, like I said in the beginning, I'm extremely confident about the thesis. Um, if any of us knew exactly about the timing, um, we would be floating on our, our yachts in the, in the Mediterranean. So nobody can know everything about, uh, about timing. But certainly the feeling at JP Morgan, and it's my personal feeling for whatever that's worth, is uh, that we're heading into much more favorable winds uh, for, uh, for this sector. Just a few, uh, a few examples. Uh, late last year, UK and US regulators uh, approved the first uh, CRISPR gene therapy uh, treatments. In this case, uh, to uh, to treat, and it, it looks like to cure um, uh, uh, sickle cell disease, which is a genetic disease, and people who are born with it it's, you have a, have in general much shorter lives than than uh, the average than than the rest of us. Extremely painful, having to have repeated blood transfusions, and so it looks like. Um, these treatments are one and done. That doesn't mean they're easy or cheap um, at this uh, at this moment, because um, certainly uh, getting um, uh, chemotherapy and a stem cell transfusion um, are big and hard. But for the people who are are suffering from this sickle cell disease, it has the potential to be life uh, changing and life saving. And and there's a lot of investment and a lot of research. There's many thousands of gene therapy trials that are going to be uh, coming to, uh, to fruition this year and in the, and in the coming years. Uh, so it's still early, but it's very exciting. Um, right now, um, there are uh, potato, wheat, coffee blights um, that are not only resulting in uh, many tens of billions of dollars of damage to, uh, to crops, if they get out of hand, in line uh, with all the disruptions uh, that we're seeing across the board from the war in Ukraine, now what's happening in, in the Red Sea, uh, this could be really devastating for, uh, for humanity. And so the capabilities of the genetics and, <clears throat> and biotech revolutions matched with the, the analytics uh, of AI is what is allow, are allowing us to think about how do we help tweak these kinds of crops so that they can survive the onslaught of these blights that are being extended by lots of things, including climate change. If anyone's eaten a papaya at any time, um, you've had a genetically modified crop because it was the genetically modified uh, um, uh, uh, papayas that basically saved that that plant, certainly in, in Hawaii and in China and, uh, and elsewhere. And so I, I could go on and on, there are lots of, of examples, uh, but this is the early stage of this revolution. And one of the, of the key things is that the learning in each area applies to everything else. Uh, the field of, of uh, cell culture and cultivated meat, which is essentially making uh, meat and other animal products that are, are biologically identical uh, to those products coming from living or no longer living animals um, can be generating using the tools of synthetic biology um, in large industrial scale bioreactors. And the world's first cell cultured burger was created in Amsterdam, uh, created in, in the Netherlands, um, not in Amsterdam, uh, elsewhere in the Netherlands, 10 years ago. And the cost was about $325,000. Uh, that cost is now down to about $10. Uh, and there is a pretty significant um, scaling up of these capabilities. But importantly, the people who did it, the people who led this process of creating this whole new field were uh, human physicians. They weren't just, I mean, they were human physicians working on humans, on uh, tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, and all of those capabilities applied um, not just to humans, but to all animals. And that's why this, where this entire field was born. A lot of the learnings from the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines um, are now being used to, to use mRNA 
um, to deliver information differently, not just to humans, but also plants uh, and animals. And there's just so much cross fertilization. And what we're seeing as a result of that, of, of technologies getting better, technologies inspiring other technologies, innovations in one field, whether it's human health or agriculture or something else, um, inspiring innovations in other fields, we're seeing a, a great acceleration. And, and that's for me why one, I'm excited about, about my collaboration with, with Wisdom Tree uh, and, this, um, uh, and this product. And two, as I said before, I'm, I'm extremely confident about the thesis. And, and the only question in my mind is the, is the timing. Uh, but we've seen with all of these uh, technologies um, that it is, it's a little bit of a wavy curve, even if it, it goes up. And then number three, um, is at least in my view, the distributed bet is the only logical bet. There will be an Amazon, uh, there will be a, a Google uh, in this area. There are many companies that are trying to be that, like Bayer and uh, and others. And we don't know what that what will happen. So in my mind, the distributed bet. We're not betting. We're betting on if. Um, this directional, if directionally um, we're right, um, we don't know whether what's the mix of big and small companies, old and, and new companies. We want to say if the thesis is right, um, then we'll win. Um, if anybody had the ability to predict the single company that's going to become the Amazon in the, of the future and you knew it with 100% certainty, it would be the right bet just to put everything on that one stock, but I certainly don't know. And so that's what we're, we're trying to do uh, is to make a, 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 real, a safe directional bet based on this wave. And, and in my view, it's really a, a tidal wave. So uh, let me stop there and hand it over to Chris. Great, great. And uh, I did pull up uh, on, the, on the screen just so people uh, can have uh, the visual uh, human health, agriculture and food, materials, chemicals and energy, biological machines and interfaces. And you see the DNA storage uh, right below in the lower right. Um, these are the areas uh, very purposefully that when the committee running the fund uh, on, on which I sit and on which uh, Jamie advises, um, when, when we get together twice a year, we are seeking exposure uh, within these four areas. Uh, we could, of course, do the whole uh, webinar here on human health by itself, but Jamie did fortunately mention uh, various things happening in agriculture uh, and food, uh, as well as biological uh, machines and interfaces. And, and Jamie, I just, just a point of curiosity, because again, people are talking about mRNA and DNA and all these things all the time, but I don't, I don't really always see DNA data storage being mentioned. Is, is it the case that people can like look up a company and, and see, you know, D, DNA actually being used uh, in this way, or is it more, uh, you know, in the theoretical uh, stage at this point? It's more than theoretical uh, because uh, materials and books and movies and all sorts of things are being stored in DNA. Uh, Twist Biosciences um, is investing a lot uh, in this field. Um, there is a coalition of Twist and Microsoft and Western Digital and others who are, are working to, uh, to build this field. And so there's a lot of progress that's, uh, that's happening. Um, but right now, it's still in the early phase. So for sure, for long-term storage, it's great. For retrieving in real time materials that are being stored, um, it's not nearly as efficient as, um, uh, as silicon. And that's why I talked about the name of my, my new book is Super Convergence, because it's all of these technologies. So DNA sequencing, so when you... Uh, when you store data as DNA, essentially you convert the ones and zeros to the A, C, T, and G of, uh, of DNA. But then to read it back, you have to sequence using a genome sequencer those genetic materials to turn them back into 
digital, at least for now, and that's how our, our computers are, are, uh, are organized. And so the only reason this is conceivable is that the cost of genome sequencing has gone down from about $3 billion 20 years ago to about $100 for a whole tube, um, sequenced human genome to about $100 now, and those costs are going down. So then the speed is, is increasing, and all these other technologies, the ability of AI uh, to understand patterns, all of these things are, are coming together. Uh, and, and certainly silicon um, uh, computer chips have a huge, not just a benefit, um, but there's an installed base of human knowledge and we'll see what happens in Taiwan, but constructive capabilities for, uh, for chips and, and all sorts of things. So it's like an, eco, an ecosystem. This is another idea, um, but it's an idea that has the potential to be at least one of the ideas that solves humans growing problem of long-term data storage because every one of our big tech companies realizes that we are facing a cliff of creating more data uh, that we can reliably store and process with the capabilities that we now have. So, and there are multiple avenues for trying to attack that problem with different kinds of chips, different kinds of materials, and DNA data storage is one of those. Uh, that, but because this is something new, that's why it's a, a relatively minimal exposure in our portfolio. But what we want to do right now, we're about um, three quarters human health and a quarter everything else. And the reason for that is that human health is more, just more mature in the application of these technologies than these other places. But we're seeing a relatively rapid transfer. And our expectation is that 75, 25 over time, um, will the, the 25 will increase as the 75 shrinks as these other sectors um, uh, become more mature. And then just final point, uh, Chris mentioned that we have our committee, and this is a thing where there's definitely, we have all of the analytics and the analytical tools, uh, but there's a lot of human wisdom and knowledge so that it's not entirely um, passive, it's certainly not entirely active, but it's somewhere in the, in the middle, there's a, a Yiddish word, seichel, which means it's kind of like the intersection of knowledge and wisdom. And so what we want to do is be very efficient to keep the, the fees down for this fund, but apply Seichel in just kind of to figure out of all the things that we, we could do, um, what are the smartest things that we can do that best leverage the, this, this transformative moment in human history. And uh, J Jamie did mention a uh, twist, and I knew it was on the uh, subsequent page here. Um, it's it's in the fund. It is uh, a public uh, company. But one of one of the other things, so J you've heard Jamie mention multiple times the idea of convergence, and he also mentioned the hype cycle, and it made me think of something we collaborated on uh, together. I'll just pull it up. We we wrote it on our blog so people can read. Um, at their leisure, but but Jamie, it's the idea that you take a company like Moderna, and Moderna, you know, hit uh, the jackpot, so to speak, in the sense that they had a particular mRNA capability that was the perfect thing what that we needed as a global society when it came to uh, developing the vaccines faster than ever before. Um, but it would be incorrect to say that's all they've ever done or will ever do. And in December, they had a very interesting uh, announcement about an ongoing melanoma uh, trial. And uh, when Jamie explained it to me, um, it sort of knocked me off uh, the chair a little bit here. So, so Jamie, I'd love for you to Tell the story of uh, the Moderna announcement that came out in December. Yeah, so so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and then about Moderna more generally. So Moderna, even the name, it's it's mRNA, mRNA company. Um, they were really struggling before the COVID nineteen pandemic because they had a promising technology that had never before been approved for. Uh, human applications. And they thought that their first product um, was going to be either an RSV vaccine or some kind of 
personalized cancer vaccine. And so as, as everybody knows, when we talk about different kinds of cancer, um, those are shorthands, but really every cancer is unique. And every cancer uh, is a, a derivative of the, the host, which is the person's individual biology. And so to target a specific cancer, you kind of have to know a lot about who the person is and about the mutations that are driving that cancer. Because what happens with, with cancer is normally for a healthy person, all of the cells in your body are collaborating with each other. It's like a symphony where everybody's playing from the, the same music. And when something goes wrong, uh, your body has a self-corrective mechanism that, that figures that out. What happens with cancer is um, somebody, or starting with maybe even a single cell, starts looking out for itself, starts playing its own music, and then recruiting others to play its music. And so rather than your whole body functioning as a symphony, uh, you have two different symphonies playing simultaneously. And what the cancer is trying to do is just follow the dictates of Darwinian evolution in order to survive. And so its strategy for survival is taking from, uh, from you. And so that's why the promise of uh, personalized or precision healthcare is to say, uh, unlike with chemotherapies, um, where we're just going to bombard the whole the whole body, even though they're much better than things uh, were in the past, we're going to find the specific molecular identity of this cancer, and we're going to target that. And 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 what I will say, just as a as a, a personal aside, uh, my father uh, was diagnosed now a year and a half ago. Uh, with neuroendocrine cancer, which is the same cancer that Steve Jobs had. And in the beginning, it was re he's doing great, but it was really dire when we went through um, the different possibilities. And I, at, that, at that time, I was writing the healthcare chapter of my book. And so I, we have a great oncologist, but I was really pushing for these. It's not gene therapies, but it's um, genetic targeted agents where we sequence the cancer cell, <clears throat> identified uh, this one mutation, the BRAF mutation, which propels the cancer cell's growth, and then targeted that um, to make it so the cancer cell wouldn't have the internal machinery uh, to grow. And my dad is doing unbelievably well. I mean, it's a, it's a one-way ticket for, for all of us. Um, but because of these, of these capabilities. So all of that is, is very exciting. And Chris and I write about the, some, some of the various specifics. Uh, and then Moderna as a company, I, I talked about kind of the, the prehistory of this fund. Uh, but when I started talking to Wisdom Tree in early 2020, uh, Wisdom Tree asked me to put together my list of a, kind of a model portfolio of what this would look like. And at that time, this was before the, the, the COVID vaccines, um, both Moderna and BioNTech um, were on my, on my list just based on my analysis of, like I said before, we're, we're betting on the broad thesis. And within that broad thesis, there are just different approaches, some of which will work and some of which won't. And we just don't know what's what. Um, and you know, certainly, we launched after uh, the the big story of the uh, of the mRNA vaccines came out in, in later uh, later 2020, but it was already on our list. And and certainly, it's my view is there will be other equivalents of this. Maybe it'll be mRNA. Maybe it'll be in in, in other areas. Uh, but this there will be moments like this. And what we want to do is kind of capture the benefits of this from wherever, wherever they come. And, and again, with Moderna, I mean, they did so well with their single product, uh, but now the, the future of their company depends on their pivot, on taking all of the cash that they have and asking the question, what more can be done using this mRNA delivery system? And certainly gene therapies, personalized uh, cancer treatments, RSV vaccines, 
really the, the sky is uh, is the limit. It's a whole new approach for delivering uh, delivering healthcare. Absolutely. And when when we go through uh, the blog here, essentially the the mega trends that are intersecting, um, uh, they they were sending data for processing uh, in uh, the AWS cloud, and so you got a bit of cloud computing. You've got obviously the the AI tools and and algorithms uh, that that beef up uh, the processing power. The the speed with which you can process the necessary information to understand the different genomes and uh, get into the the appropriate patterns such that you can uh, formulate the right or uh, potentially the right responses. Uh, it is remarkable. And and Jamie, in some of the articles that you see, pe people sort of uh, they they do a funny thing. They basically think about. Uh, discovering drugs, and they say drugs have been going in the opposite direction of chips, and they even do e, e rooms law. I think that that's how you pronounce it, where it's it's the reverse of Moore's law, where Moore's law the chips are getting smaller and smaller and more and more powerful. So um, you know, reversing a, a lot of the articles and and the companies, some of which are in our strategy, are really aimed at reversing this uh, perception and, and reality that developing a new molecule into a drug uh, takes uh, seemingly a longer and longer time. Uh, the, the chances of success are, are really not high uh, at all. And uh, if, even if you can make it a little bit faster, a little bit more efficient, uh, it, it could really have a remarkable result. Yeah. So, I mean, certainly the super convergence of all of these technologies, that's, that's the essential point. They're all as I was mentioning early, earlier, all technologies are inspiring other technologies and inspired by um, other, other technologies. A lot of the, the new gene therapies, for example, certainly are not cheap. They're actually extremely uh, expensive, but those costs will go down. And the costs, for example, of curing sickle cell disease, um, it, it shouldn't be measured or balanced against the cost of you know, one day's treatment for sickle cell. It's well, what does it cost for the lifetime of care uh, for somebody with uh, with sickle cell? And then that becomes a payment issue. It becomes um, uh, it becomes an insurance issue. Uh, but then, as Chris was saying, there's a whole other uh, broader point of essentially digital twinning, and that's why the ChatGPT and those other um, large language models work is. In a digital environment, they're developing essentially a map of a different world. In this case, in that case, the, the world of, of human knowledge. And the goal here is to create digital twins of discovery processes, uh, digital twins of cells, digital twins of human patients. And when a lot of the testing, or at very least the hypothesis generation, uh, can happen very, very rapidly. Uh, in digital environments using advanced AI and, and machine learning capabilities, it really just opens up a whole new avenue uh, of thinking just of how do we not just cure human diseases, how do we just achieve different goals that we want to achieve? And certainly treating diseases <clears throat> or making uh, or, or altering plants uh, so they can uh, be more productive for food or survive in harsher climate stressed um, environments or, or creating um, algae that can be uh, extremely efficient, uh, generating energy or, or all sorts of other things. Now, now Jamie, I want to go in a direction here. I don't believe you and I have talked about it in the past, if, if people can gather, we've certainly talked about AI and uh, the convergence in the book in the past. Yeah, and just as you see, just visually, um, we're coming out of the longest downturn in this sector, or maybe coming out uh, in in 20 years. So, I mean, I think this this thing speaks for itself. But this, all of these technology, whether it's AI or cloud or, or any of it, it's all wavy. Uh, that's the nature of, of these kinds of, uh, of assets. And, and the question is, where are we going? And I have a lot of confidence about that. And the second question is, is what are the timing and what's the right moment to, to get in? Because 
logically, um, uh, the right time is when things are down, even though emotionally people feel the right time is when things are up. There could be, look, uh, you know, they, we, we don't operate in a vacuum and uh, we did see a bit, a bit of a response, maybe not as much as some of our software oriented strategies, but a bit of a response to the perception kind of uh, October, November into December of last year when people were thinking, OK, uh, maybe interest rates are going to be more likely to head in a lower rather than higher direction. And so, you know, that's uh, besides AI, uh, the other big thing that you can't avoid in the headlines would have to be uh, discussions about interest rates and uh, the potential path there that could be taken. And, uh, you, you know, there there could be some duration, meaning uh, sensitivity to lowering interest rates embedded in uh, some of these higher risk uh, companies. That That's a story that, that has already widely proliferated. So if people are, are looking for that macro catalyst or more positive macroeconomic backdrop, uh, it is quite possible that you see something uh, happening on that front in 2024, which uh, was certainly not present in 22 or 23. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.